the most expensive election in history, costing billions of dollars and bankrolled by a few millionaires. Lobbyists and special interests, the people with the $10 million checks who are trying to buy this election. When 400 individuals have more wealth than the bottom 150 million Americans, and the top 1% donate more political money than the bottom 90%, we ask, what's the price for democracy? We follow the money line from Tampa to Charlotte to Washington to New York to find out how business is transforming politics in America. I am Marwan Bishara, and this is Empire. Welcome to the Oscars of American politics, complete with multi-million dollar sets and red carpets. Every four years before their final push to Washington, politicians gather their donors and the media for a few days in late summer. Theirs is a cozy relationship, lubricated by billions of dollars of campaign spending. While the final numbers won't be known until after the elections, we do know these will be the most expensive elections in history. We ask, has money fundamentally changed the nature of American democracy? Soon, I'll be joined by Melanie Sloan, executive director of the watchdog group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, Steve Hursting, the co-founder of the Center for Competitive Politics and the key architect of the super PAC system, Clyde Wilcox, a professor of government at Georgetown University, and author of over 30 books, including Interest Groups in American Campaigns, The New Face of Electioneering. And Larry Beinart, novelist and the author of the critically acclaimed novel, American Hero, which was made into film, Wag the Dog. The story of money and politics is an old one, which we've seen played out in every possible setting with every imaginable cast of characters. Four years ago, Obama was the first presidential candidate since modern campaign finance reform in the 1970s to refuse public funding. And he raised an unprecedented amount of money. But this year will shatter all past records. The US Federal Election Commission has said campaign spending could top $11 billion, almost triple that of 2008. Not only is the amount of money in this election ballooning, it's coming from fewer and fewer people. And this year's multi-billion dollar election drama has a peculiar American twist. We got married and moved into a basement apartment. Our desk was a door propped up on sawhorses. Our dining room table was a fold-down ironing board in the kitchen. Nowhere in the world is more money spent attempting to recast millionaire politicians as ordinary working people. And a quick glance at the state of the American economy and the stark inequality of wealth is enough to see why. Nearly one in two Americans, almost 150 million people, have fallen into poverty or are classified as low income. Meanwhile, the six heirs to the Walmart empire have a fortune equivalent to the bottom 30% of US society. An overwhelming majority of Americans polled say there is too much money in politics. So how did this happen? Last week, the Supreme Court reversed a century of law that I believe will open the floodgates for special interests. The Supreme Court's ruling in January of 2010 said that corporations and unions should be able to spend on political ads, and that also they could give money to other groups that were spending money on these sorts of ads, which just sort of upended the way campaign finance restrictions worked. The only people who aren't going to know who's giving that money are the American voters. While the candidates carefully cultivate populist persona, they have become increasingly dependent on the largesse of a small group of billionaires. A coalition led by industrialists Charles and David Koch have pledged to spend as much as $400 million to defeat Barack Obama. Sheldon Adelson has already spent $41 million of his $30 billion fortune and has said he would more than double that. This money means that one person could have a substantial effect on the outcome of this election. 
American citizens may be more inclined to think that the game is rigged and that their vote ultimately isn't as valuable as it once was. A pool of 2,100 people have given more than $200 million to the 2012 campaigns so far. In other words, 1% of donors are exerting greater financial influence on the 2012 race than the bottom 90%. But this is only the money we know about. Now he's adding $4 billion in debt every day, borrowing from China for his spending. That's what every man, woman, and Most of the cash America. being funneled into this year's attack ads is anonymous money raised through shell organizations that do not have to disclose their finances, so-called dark money. Citizens United's decision said, fine, you're going to have this flood of special interest money coming in but you're also going to have disclosure and you're going to have the idea of transparency. True in the case of super PACs, but not true in the case of these dark money social welfare nonprofits. American voters might never know who is funding the advertising because these groups are only required to report a fraction of the money they raise. Not only is it legal, it's defended as free speech. The man credited with leading the charge for unlimited spending in politics is a prominent conservative attorney. He is the architect. He is the guru. James Bob argues that companies shouldn't have to be, be punished for their free speech, and he really believes that. I caught up with James Bob at the Republican National Convention in Tampa and began by asking him whether more political money is healthy for democracy. Uh, when you have campaign finance restrictions, limiting what can be spent, limiting what can be raised, uh, the result is you reduce the number of voices and messages that go out. So that's why I'm in favor of more voices, more messages, more money being spent. People need this information in order to make an informed choice. So what you're saying is that political money is expression, it's speech. Our First Amendment protects the right of every citizen to criticize any government official they choose. Now, in order to do that, when you've got a country of 350 million people, uh, you know, you've, you've got to spend money to get the message out. I mean, people can stand on the street corner, but you can't reach too many people. Does that then give due influence to those who have more money? They basically will speak louder and clearer than anyone else. Well, what we have found in America is that there are rich people on both sides. Uh, in fact, uh, there are more liberal rich people in the United States, more people who support Obama and the Democratic Party who are rich uh, than who support Romney and the conservative side. So there are rich people on both sides, there's people of average means on both sides. What, one thing about America is that you can pool your resources. In other words, people of average means can come together in a group, a labor union, an advocacy group, a lobby group, citizens group, whatever you want to call them. And then they can, by pooling their resources, that means that the average person can participate. We don't just leave it to uh, individuals based on how much money they have. We have groups so that everyone can participate. Whether they are Democrats or Republicans, supporters to the super PAC in general, rich individuals or corporations, are putting out there the absolute majority of the money that's being spent in politics in America. No, they're, they're putting out the Republican uh, donors are contributing more money to super PACs than Democrat donors. But you cannot, but that's not all the spending in America. There are political parties, there are candidates, there's the labor unions, and then there's the media that's overwhelmingly liberal in the United States. So you have, when you have spending by all of these groups, what I see is a level playing field. Actually, the reason liberals don't like super PACs is because it has leveled the playing field. Back in 2004 or before that, 2% of the money during election time was not disclosed. Now the figures are something like 40% of the money is not disclosed. We don't know who is donating that money. Is that helpful to the democratic process? I, I'm in favor of disclosure by uh, candidates, political parties, and PACs. The problem is in America that we have very low contribution limits. And the result is, over time, these low contribution limits force money into other independent groups. So the, you see it then as so if they raise spiraling those, out of control in, in some way. It's some getting way. worse. It's getting worse. It's getting worse because of contribution limits. 
And until we raise contribution limits or eliminate them, this, is, is, this will always be a problem. So the question is going to be for us, are we going to have these contribution limits? Are they going to be so low? And creating a distorted system where it, the money is forced into the pockets of people that are not as accountable or transparent, or will the candidate be able to spend it? I think we're going to repeal contribution limits. I think that's what's going to happen. Melanie Larry, Steve Clyde, welcome to Empire. Let's start with our basic assumptions. More and more money into the US elections by fewer and fewer people, less and less transparently. And the numbers are staggering. Tens of people donated hundreds of millions. 50 individuals have donated more than 50% of individual donors. Certainly, money speaks far louder than words. Melanie. Money does speak louder than words, and those with the most money uh, are allowed to have the most words and the loudest voices. They're the ones who are controlling the television commercials that all Americans are seeing on their screens this election season, and it is a significant problem. Smaller voices, less money is all being drowned out. But all this smaller money is not exactly saying the same thing, is it? No, no, no. There's a wide disparity of views being represented by all of this money. And frankly, we have much more speech now. We do have more financing of campaigns and related issues. And we know about that in large part because it is disclosed. There was a lot of activity previous, in previous cycles before super PACs that was not disclosed. It was these issue ads through, through uh, special kinds of social As in 2004 and the likes. Yes, you, you may have heard of the Swift Boat Veterans for Truth. Well, they were, they were outside of the, the regulatory system and they spoke quite a bit. Uh, they're inside the regulatory system now. They're, they're, uh, the people like them in the 2012 cycle and 2010 cycle as well. Uh, Larry, they might differ. Some might uh, vote or support uh, uh, the likes of Obama. Others might support Romney. But they do have something in common. There is something called class consciousness in America. Isn't well, there? okay. All right. So here, here's the Iran story. Okay, I went to visit Iran a couple of years ago. And Iran has a democracy. Um, we may not think so, but they really do. The limitation is this. If you want to be a candidate for public office, you go before the Council of Guardians. The Council of Guardians decides, are you religiously orthodox enough? And if so, then you can campaign. And once you're in that campaign, they have real elections, and they're really contested, and they're really saying nasty things about each other and run ads and all that good stuff. OK. United States, we have a system. Call, call their system the hard machine, ours is the soft machine. Average price to run for Congress is $1 million. Average price to run for Senate is $5 million. So before you can run for Congress, you have to demonstrate that you are acceptable to the people who will give you enough money to allow you to run. Okay? So effectively, you have a council of guardians and there are a council of financial guardians. Well, soft money. Yeah, soft money. Uh, well, Clyde, okay. you think it's actually effective? You spend more money and you'll get better results in the elections? Not always. A lot of times candidates who spend the most money lose. You know, I don't think we spend too much money in elections, although I think the average American would not say, I wish I had twice as many TV ads right now. Mm -hmm. But I do think, uh, uh, in contradiction to Steve, that a lot of this money is not transparent in this election. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know how it's being spent. And I think that's a problem. And you don't think $11 billion, as has been estimated, is a staggering figure um, for an it's, election it's, campaign? It's a lot of money, but we spend a lot of money advertising beer, advertising you know, cars, and so forth. I think it's being spent very badly. And I think the messages are not educating voters. But I think the total amount of money by itself is not the problem. So, so if, the, if the total money is not the problem, is the disparities in who spends the money the problem? Meaning 1% of the donors spend as much as 95% of the donors? Well, I would disagree with Clyde. I think too much money is being spent. And I don't think American democracy is better off because of all the money spent and all the ads that are out there, especially when, if you consider, most of those ads are full of lies anyway. Uh, and uh, the ads, particularly by uh, the, uh, the groups that have very innocuous sounding names, but nobody knows who's really behind them or who's funding those ads, those are the nastiest, most vitriolic ads with the least truth. And yet, those are ads that are out there in order to sway voters. So I don't see how Americans So you don't accept the off. fact that this level the playing field, as it were, media versus 
super PAC ads and television. It narrows playing field. How is that? Well, it limits, you know, okay, for example, there should be a really robust dialogue about going back to, uh, going back to breaking up the big banks, r seriously regulating the financial markets, raising taxes on excess income, a whole bunch of stuff that has worked in the but past. But the banks are not even part of the US but, agenda. They're not part of the agenda because we have one party that is owned and operated by the financial in interests and one party that sells out to the financial interests. I'm not going to ask okay. you which is which. Yeah, well, it's <laughs> obvious which is which. <laughs> right, right. You know, I mean, uh, the Republicans make no bones about representing the power of money and that money should be unrestricted and buy anything it wants and do anything it wants. And Democrats, you know, kind of say, well, there are other social economic issues that should be respected, but we won't push them too hard because we need your contributions. Uh, money narrows the dialogue. So actually, the more money, the merrier for the Republicans, indeed, at the end of the day. Well, I think it's the more money, the merrier for America, because what you do is you get more voices out there. No, you get fewer the, voices. The, the $11 billion figure you cited really has to be compared to what? We, uh, we've accumulated about $5.6 trillion in debt. We have a $16 trillion deficit. We just hit that milestone. We have about $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities. And the government uh, takes it upon itself to decide, in some, in some sense, how that's divided up. So the citizens want to be able to speak about that because it's, after all, their representatives in the Capitol that are supposedly benefiting them. They want to have some say in that process. So, and with regard to why are the, uh, why, are, why is neither party really speaking much about the banks during this election? It's possible it's because they don't want to shine too much light on the role of Fannie Mae, which was mortgages, and Freddie Mac. You mean their own responsibility? Mortgage incentives, mortgage incentives that the Federal Reserve, our central bank, really had to accommodate it, along the way. You it's don't not think the average citizen, though, who's sitting there supporting these elections. That's just simply not true. Very few people are actually sending in $20 contributions to members of Congress. The people who are funding these elections are, for the most part, millionaires and billionaires through the super PACs and other uh, secret kinds actually, of funds. Actually, the number is quite amazing, Melanie. 2,100 people have donated more than 2.5 million people in this country. Right, and, and that fits in with the idea that it's very few Americans who are actually behind all of this. And even when we're talking about uh, campaign contributions directly to members of Congress, most of the people who make those kind of contributions are lobbyists and members of trade associations and corporations, all people who want something from those members of Congress. So your average folks back home, they're not the people supporting these folks. Actually, races. Clyde, What's, for someone, an outsider like me, is a bit interesting to look at is we're not only talking about individuals anymore. Now we're talking about corporations. Right. So yeah. corporations, since the 2010 ruling, are treated as citizens. Right. What does that add to the equation? Well, it's just more money for the groups that have already had advantages. Now, of course, unions also have advantages as well. But uh, in this particular election campaign, I think Steve's really wrong on this. It's not the average citizen asking a millionaire to give money to a super PAC to represent their speech. Uh, the millionaires are either giving money for interested reasons or ideological reasons, neither one of which is necessarily what the average American cares about in this election. Which, which actually, I want, to, I want to take it back to your original Iran story. So what would it mean if an Iranian, Israeli, Saudi, French corporation opens its own offshore or its own onshore corporation in the United States and it donates huge amounts of money, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to a certain candidate? Would Iran then or Saudi Arabia be able to play a role in the U.S. elections? Let's be clear about it. In, in the United States, we have a ban on foreign participation, contributions and independent speech from president to dog catcher, from the very highest to the very lowest of our elected offices. Um, so that's, the, the law is really written as no, no. tightly as it possibly can. But Steve, the domestic, what about, what but the about domestic, an American registered the domestic, corporation? Exactly right. That is the supported domestic, by an outside corporation. Right. The domestic subsidiary of a foreign corporation, its employees are allowed to participate, but it really has to be a part of their salaries and the money they raise from their activities here in the United States. Otherwise, it's captured under the law and it's illegal. You don't think if uh, an American corporation that co-ventures on various international uh, investments with a foreign corporation might have a vested interest to support that country's interest using its own corporate money in America? I think the interest is there. 
I just think the law prevents it as well as it possibly no, can. No, it doesn't. The law is out there, so you're certainly right that there is a law, but yes. there are always ways around a law, and especially in this situation where we're talking about multinational corporations mm -hmm. and we're talking about American subsidiaries. Sure, the money has to be American, but if the money is uh, even developed here in America, created or, or earned here in America, right. but of course that corporation that may have a much greater interest in another country in, say, oil fields in some uh, Arab land, they're going to be sp spending their money accordingly. We're seeing a very minimal amount of corporate money going into this election. What we're really seeing is money from individuals and wealthy individuals. And the reason is really pretty basic. Michael Jordan, a famous basketball player, the f most famous, the best, said, I don't speak about politics because Republicans buy gym shoes too. I'm not going to, I'm not going to uh, Again, alienate to, any customers. I have to disagree with Corporations you. are really in the same boat. And if you look at what happened with the Target Corporation, it gave $150,000 to a pro-business group. It was boycotted instantly. And it said, no mas. So now finished. corporations are giving money secretly. They're giving to organizations with innocuous sounding names. Hence like we the come American to the lack Action. of transparency. Yes, the American right. Action Network, for example, Crew discovered earlier this year that Aetna had given over $4 million mm. to the American Action Network, which was running ads. So there are lots of corporations that are likely giving ads to certain kinds of organizations that have no transparency and no disclosure. We just don't know, and they're giving it that way so they can avoid being boycotted but yeah. still affect the election. And this is a really critical point. We just don't know. Right? We can find out about a particular corporation with one particular contribution, but it's really a problem that we can't track the money. But, but also, I mean, I could understand corporations in general in the last 40, 50 years have been dominant because they are the richer giving money or to candidates. And now suddenly there are these, I don't want to call them zealots, um, you know, the, 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 the Sheldon Edelson types and, and the Koch brother types and others and, you know, the Haim Saban types and so on and so forth, who are ready to give tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars to one candidate or to one party. They are certainly disturbing the corporate establishment balance in the country. You know, I mean, okay, okay, Edelson, you know, an individual lunatic. Uh, I think of George Soros as an individual idealist. Okay, my, my bias. Yeah, your there. perspective. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, um, and that's always happened. A long tradition of um, socialist millionaires, okay, in Britain, who gave lots of money to progressive causes. And, and, and in America, and lots, I mean, a lot of that stuff happens. Um, and personally, I think it's fun, okay, seeing Adelson give... How many millions of dollars? Did 100 he... million or so, or the 40 million spent on ads. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought it was 10 million to Gingrich. But he gave it to, to Gingrich, right? You know, I mean, it was like right. it was like two clouds at the circus. No, right. But so, but Harry, right. Hold, hold your thought. Hold that thought, and we're gonna be back after a quick news break. Welcome back to Empire with my guests, Melanie Sloan, Larry Barnard, Steve Horsting, and Professor Clyde Wilcox. In a minute, we'll be speaking to Senator Luger, who's been a Washington insider for the past 36 years and who knows the ins and outs of money in politics. The money situation is really out of control and probably will go even further out of control. But before that, a quick look at what donors get for their money. There is no end of ways to spend your money this election season. See Obama hang out on stage with Al Green. Photo up with the press. Big time dinner with Obama at the home of a Hollywood star. And meet, meet him at a reception in Aspen, Colorado. Picture, no problem. High roller, how about a weekend at a Utah resort? What are donors really getting in return for their money? Can US elections be bought? Even high-profile lobbyists are now criticizing the growing role of money in politics. There is way too much money in politics. There's a flood of money after uh, some of the recent court decisions. The real problem that rots the system is they have to spend so much time fundraising, they have little time left to do the serious business of our government and our nation. Candidates spend an inordinate amount of time fundraising, and some skeptics argue that it is not so much that their time is taken up raising money, but that their attentions are focused on a tiny elite. You have candidates who are spending an obsessive amount of time trying to dance in a way that inspires the large contributors to give. Um, and that, in my view, is the core of the corruption here. 
Uh, it's not the amount of money. It's not, um, it's not even necessarily that a candidate is spending 30% of his time or 40% of his time raising money. It's that he's spending 30 or 40% or 50% or in some of these congressional contexts, up to 70% of their time raising money from the tiniest slice of the 1%, meaning they can't help but become especially sensitive to the needs or the desires of that tiny slice of the 1%. He calculates that less than 50 individuals are responsible for almost 50% of the money spent by outside super PACs. Others disagree. They don't believe that money dictates policy. Money does not buy results. Uh, money may um, buy courtesy and access, and that's an issue, but it certainly doesn't buy results. The fact is, is that uh, you get a lot less for a political contribution than you know, sort of the man in the street that most people think. Supporters of the system say mega donors are funding campaigns out of a desire to participate in the civic process. But according to various studies, the rates of return on lobbying are astonishing. 100, 400, even 22,000 percent. Last year, even the International Monetary Fund produced a report tying financial industry lobbying to favorable legislation for banks and lenders. There's no doubt that there are lots of people in the system, on the left and the right, who are giving money for the best possible reasons. But there's also no doubt that uh, all the way down, there are people who are giving money in the system because it is a very wise investment. There is no denying that money means influence, but it's not necessarily quid pro quo. Most members of Congress um, assert vehemently that they can't be bought. And I'm sure that's true. If you walked into a congressman and said, how much is it going to take for me to get your vote? Um, the congressman would be outraged and kick you out, probably report you to the, the US attorney. But what congressmen fail to recognize or acknowledge is that these bonds of obligation get formed subconsciously. One man who knows exactly how Washington works is Indiana's Richard Lugar, the most senior Republican senator. Just this year, Lugar lost his bid for re-election. Groups opposing the incumbent senator outspent his campaign by more than a million dollars. I caught up with a senator at his offices in Washington and asked him if he was hostage to big donors. Well, I wasn't a hostage. My super PACs and force didn't raise very much money, uh -huh. at least the ones that were supporting me. But I did have support from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, for example, which is not a super PAC. It's been out there for quite a while and it's very conspicuous in terms of their ads. So there was uh, certainly money from outside. You're almost six million or so. In my behalf. I have no idea ultimately how much came in from whom. Uh, this is still being sorted out, but it was a lot of money in one primary contest. Clearly now in the case of the presidential elections, we are seeing huge amounts of money. This yes. is the most expensive elections in the history of democracy, mm -hmm. let alone the history of America. So what does that say about the role of money in a country where there are angrier people, bigger disparities of wealth? Well, without getting into the philosophy of whether this much money ought to be out there, it's, it's not clear, really, what the money is going to do at this stage. But what it says, uh, Senator, is that if you're not able to raise hundreds of millions of dollars, or as a senator probably in the next four years, tens of millions of dollars, you're not going to be elected. That renders you hostage to big money. Yes, either that or you have a lot of money to begin with. You are a self-financed candidate. That's true. There's, a, there's lots of them out there. Now, I, I agree with your, perhaps your general line of thinking, and, and that is that the money situation is really out of control and probably will go even further out of control. So, so you agree then, Senator, that if this continues, if the trend continues, politicians in this country are going to be hostage to big money in the country? Well, if not hostage, they clearly are going to be seeking indebted, this. Yeah, so indebted, money. perhaps. Um, and and it's, it's simply uh, a bad situation, I believe, in terms of good government. Um, but I would say, uh, you know, as a conservative, uh, it appears to me best for the political parties to be uh, having contests as opposed to a situation in which the parties are superseded 
by uh, charismatic uh, money, individual yeah. money, corporate money. Yeah. Do you think money is speech? And hence freedom of speech is consistent with freedom to spend money well, in politics? Well, it's an interesting argument. And I, I don't have uh, an adamant view either way. I think uh, being able to spend money uh, is an important way of being able to express yourself. However, uh, even uh, the excesses that are here really have to be recognized. How is that then uh, squared with democracy, the rule of law in this country? Well, if you are a, a billionaire and you're prepared to put $100 uh, million, say, into this election, you will argue that this is freedom of speech, that as an American, I have the right to speak out and furthermore to use my money to make certain that my point of view, my freedom of speech is extended. This is basically where the Supreme Court came out in the Citizens United case. Uh, I, I would just say simply that uh, at some point, it appears to me that the structure of our government is going to change if in fact billionaires are calling the shots and demanding at least their point of view. Now, in some case, the, the billionaire's point of view may not be a bad one. Maybe that it's time to cut taxes or cut the spending or get the budget under control. Sometimes, however, the billionaire does have an interest in oil or um, in some other energy form or in some particular business situation. Uh, that becomes a little more dubious. This is no longer a general proposition right. of cutting taxes. It may be of enhancing one's own industry and, and wealth. Uh, but whatever it may be, uh, my, my point is there have to be limits. And this is not going to be easy to come by because people are going to claim that the Constitution asserts the rights of the people to do this, this, and this. Other people will make other assertions. I think we're going to be back into the Supreme Court in due course on some case, and we shall see then how the ruling goes. Uh, Melanie, let's pick it up from where Senator Luger left off. So, how much you actually get for your money once you move from elections to real life here in Washington? Um, well, it depends. Uh, you can certainly, if you've donated a lot and bundled a lot, which is where you've collected a lot of checks for, for members of Congress, uh, you can get all sorts of things ranging from uh, positions on advisory boards to an ambassadorship to another country. Um, a lot of me uh, members of Congress uh, arrange lots of breakfasts, lunches, dinners, all sorts of access so that you, if you have issues you're pushing, can come in and talk to them about it and you'll get a better hearing than anyone else. Actually, I, I looked at uh, one of those studies by Kansas University, Steve. They say multinational corporations get 22,000% on their money, meaning for every dollar spent, they get $220 back in tax breaks. That's quite amazing. I, I can't imagine that that makes much sense. Frankly. Are you doubting the Kansas well, University study? <laughs> I haven't read the study. But what I do note is this. Um, if you want to look at the ratio of that, and you can also apply it to campaign spending in the United States compared to the amount of money our government regulates in the economy. Basically what you have is, while you have the government deciding where $5.6 trillion will or will not be spent, and how we will deal with $100 trillion in unfunded liabilities, people who are sovereign, after all, in the United States are going to want to have a say in that. They're going to want to speak to their representatives and say, here's what we believe about this. Really, in a way, the right to speak is the most polite and best way of self-defense. It's a beginner for self-defense. It really <laughs> is in an economy like this. Clyde, so they pay, for, they pay their money, they pay their dues in the elections. Now they become politicians in Congress. How much do they owe those who supported them in the elections? Well, it turns out not to be all that simple because there's lots of people who supported them in the elections. But what you typically find is any former member of Congress will point to one or two votes where they changed a vote because there was an important donor involved. You see party leaders often saying, boy, this interest has helped us. We can't take this on in this session. But it's not simple. It's not like there's a price tag and you get this for that. It's, there's you, lots of other influences. Exactly. Lesip, uh, the professor from Harvard, told us that it's really not a simple of, you know, question of barter, that it is more of a dependency relationship that's created between donors and donee, meaning, meaning a politician becomes more dependent in general term, meaning Washington becomes 
a dependency culture of economy whereby politicians always expect richer people to give them money and richer people always expect something back. And you know, I, I think here's where I maybe disagree a little bit with, uh, with uh, Steve. I, I think that if we had contribution limits but still spent the same amount of money, the candidates would then go out and get money from a wide, wider range of donors like Obama sort of did in his first campaign, there's a lot of people out there who might be willing to give small amounts of money if they didn't see $10 million checks coming into a super PAC, and they think, what's my $10 doing? But, so, you, but, but you know but, what happens at the end of the day? What happens at the end of the day is that in real life, Washington here in Capitol Hill, what we have is special interest, so-called, meaning corporate money is represented by 23 times more lobbyists than the average citizens' unions, association, and so on. Well, you know, part of the problem is this, okay, what they spend their time doing is raising money, campaigning, and maybe having the patience to sit through a hearing when the cameras are on. They don't have time to think. They don't have time to read. But, they're, but they write legislations. They, mm -hmm. No, they, they write laws. Right. No, they, they do don't. not write laws. No, I mean, like, doesn't matter. <laughs> they vote do on not that they, assistance. Okay, is so they mm -hmm. don't have time. They don't, so who they write don't the laws, even, Larry? Who they write go, the laws? They go to, they say, okay, you know, this, this thing is coming up for a law. We need, we need actual written legislation. And, they, and their local lobbyist supplies it. Local lobbyist supplies it to their aides? Yeah, through that the aides. Sort of, yeah, the, the lobbyists write the laws. That, that, that is quite an exercise in Washington, isn't it? Uh, there are a lot of policy shops in the district that spend a lot of time thinking about what model legislation ought to look like. But I'd like to go back to another but point. No, no, Steve, that's a fancy way of saying it. But I, do, I know, that. do I know? Sure, during okay. the Bush administration, do Exxon lobbyists were coming in and writing Melanie. the energy policy. Melanie. No, that was actually done. There was plenty it's, of articles about it. So, And they're not alone. Do Wall I Street executives that. come in and write the, the banking regs. That's well, what happened. I think because everything we say is under <laughs> the law, but at the end of the day, someone writes the law. No, but Marwan, what I'm saying is that uh, it's one thing for me to very much, very strongly suspect that the Center for American Progress wrote the health care bill. I don't know that. I could no more prove that than prove the sky is purple. I don't know that. But there's a lot of reason to believe that the policy shops in the district write a lot of model legislation. Yes, that's true. There is such a culture in Washington. Sure, there, I believe there is. I can't prove it. Now, let me also go back to a point Melanie made and Larry made. Melanie said, you know, these elections, they never really stop. And Larry has said, congressmen spend about 30% of their time raising money. And that's because the amount of money that the candidates themselves are allowed to take in is so small relative to inflation, what inflation has done to our dollars. And that's no secret to anyone in the world, that United States currency is being debased, frankly. They have to spend that time, because to have any resources at all under current law, they've got to raise it in these dribs and drabs. But in the end of the day, does that or does that not create dependency on the source of money? Well, you know what, if I may, Marwan, if they weren't dependent on the people who hire them for their $50, and by the way, President Obama got lots of $50 contributions. If they weren't dependent on the people themselves, whom they represent, they'd be dependent on news producers, on news hosts, on a lot of broadcast outlets and other people who get their message out. But After just, all, this money but, is to get the message but, but out. Listen, listen to what he, he said. If they're not dependent on the people who hired them, that's not the people they call on the telephone, <laughs> right? Well, the, when they're uh, making phone call, they call after phone call, they're calling people who can write large checks, typically not from their district. And they're not calling anyone who buys a television on an installment plan. They're not calling anyone who has to wonder, can I afford to go out to dinner tonight, right? They're calling people who can write a check for, you know, $1,000 or whatever, and then calling people to say, can you give money to a super PAC, or it would be awfully nice if you help. In fact, there are donors that I know who don't live in D.C. who say they never answer the 202 area code because it's always going to be another politician begging for money. And they don't need to talk to Nancy right. Pelosi or John Boehner or any of them anymore. They can no. talk to them anytime they well, want. Actually, they have more access than they could ever want. Th this, this actually opens uh, two, two issues for me, uh, Larry. One, and this is your arena, who's wagging who? <laughs> are the politicians wagging the businessmen or are the businessmen wagging the politicians? Um, who's checking down who? Really? That's an interesting question. I think, I think it's, I think money's the gatekeeper. And the way it works is you, 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 don't, you, don't, get in the, you don't get in the race, you don't get to play unless you have 
you are able to demonstrate you are but the once kind of person they want there. What I found quite paradoxical, Melanie helps us out here, is that Americans in general are disturbed by the fact that there's so much money in politics and in elections. So why does this continues to spiral out of control? Because they're not so concerned that they're voting against the people who are not doing anything to stop it. There was a, a bill in Congress last year to help require more disclosure of the, all the campaign spending. And uh, the Republicans voted against it en masse. And there is not enough of uh, outrage in the American population that they'll say, well, we will vote against people on this issue. We will get out there and insist that all our candidates believe in transparency, believe in disclosure, or promise to do something about this. So yeah. the American population isn't doing enough. They're, they say I, they don't like it, but they're not willing to get out there and vote on this issue. Also, because there's no choice. Right. Yeah. There is no choice. Right. <laughs> there's, no guy, there's no guy running without money. Right. And if there is, okay, the, um, call it the soft core establishment, the news media, the whatever you want to call it, erases them. I tried to help a guy a couple of years ago who was running in a primary against Hillary Clinton. Okay? And... He could, he could not even get invited to debate her because he had not raised enough money. Okay? So money does get you into it's the, the gatekeeper. game. It's the gatekeeper. It's the gatekeeper. And if you are not a person capable, say you want to run in a primary against Hillary Clinton, if you cannot raise 5 or $10 million, let's, they, let's push, CBS won't even talk to you. Let's push back against that theory just a bit if we can. We just had an interview with Senator Luger, who served Indiana voters for 36 years. Um, he, was in, he was challenged by Richard Murdoch, someone no one's ever heard of. I couldn't pick him out of a lineup. I've lived in the district for about 10 or 12 years. Um, my point is, there's no greater special interest, if you listen to Melanie and others, than the Chamber of Commerce, the United States Chamber of Commerce. That is supports Luger. It's supposed to be a massive uh, uh, special interest. Not even they could save Richard Luger from the voters of Indiana. And that's something to keep in mind here. Well, I'm sorry, that's not exactly right. Narratives. So the Chamber of Commerce, um, and besides, we don't actually know who the Chamber of Commerce is. That's a lot of people who, a lot of corporations who gave money to the Chamber of Commerce to support Richard Luger in the first place. But Richard Murdoch had an awful lot of money. He had money from uh, coming in from across the country, from probably the Koch brothers, certainly the American for for prosperity group, the Tea Party group, spent a lot of money on his race. So there was a lot of outside money, not money from Indiana, not just money focused on it, that Indiana voters were putting out to help defeat Richard Lugar, who was no longer viewed as conservative enough and towing the conservative line. So it's really not clear. We don't know what money helped defeat Richard Lugar yet. With more money coming into the elections, will we, are we going to see more and more of it being reflected in lawmaking in Washington, Clyde? Well, you know, it's, um, there's different sides coming in with the money, so I don't necessarily think that would be the case. But um, here's what I think is wrong with uh, the way that uh, we're, we're looking at this problem. Because what he says is, look, there's these ideologues on both sides, and then you're saying there's the interested money, and that's exactly right. There's interested money or there's ideologues, and there's not money in the middle, right? So the ideologues on the Democratic Party are not the average Democrat. The ideologues on the Republican Party are the people that want to knock off Luger, right? And that's not the range of opinion. I wish I lived in Steve's ideal world where the citizens are aggregating no, their money and they're choosing their speech. Well, and they are. And they they are aggregating. That's, but, what I'm, but my point about the ideology is the giving is not to purchase favors. Yeah, and that, because, that part is not, but it reason, distorts the, the system. Not the the reason, well, the reason but, but not, systematic. The reason but, we but know it that, Marwan. distorts the system. And the reason anyway. we know that, Marwan, is because they would hedge. If we're about purchasing the next incumbent, they would hedge. They hedge in the markets. They hedge with metals. They hedge in everything else they do when they invest. But business they does hedge. Mm -hmm. But they, these donors to super PACs are not hedging. Foster no, no, Freeze but business is not in general a dollar hedges. to the other party. Some, some business Soros, Peter supports Lewis for not. Obama. Some support Romney. So business in general hedges its bets. Some support this candidate, some support the other Business candidate. in general is, is too far of a, generaliza a generalization, is my point. Well, is, I will is say, it, is previously, it? Yeah, actually, it uh, up through the, uh, the uh, I would say, early 2000 or so, you would have seen um, 
businesses that had political action committees, and they would have given to both sides. They would have given to members uh, on both the Democratic and the Republican sides because they were hedging their bets. And I, I would say it's uh, something more recent, uh, something that started probably really with uh, a former majority leader, Tom DeLay, where he said it's unacceptable to hedge your bets. You must give far more money to the Republican Party was really his philosophy. Uh, and now we are seeing much less of that sort of hedging, although I still think some businesses do. Probably Goldman about, Sachs is a good example right, of that. With their campaign mm -hmm. contributions, but that's mm -hmm. very different than the super PAC money, and even more different is the money that they give to these secretive organizations that can never be traced back to them. Clyde, let's connect both half of our show. So deregulating the elections, will that then lead to deregulating the economy? To deregulating the economy. We've, we've pretty much come as far as we can in deregulating campaign finance. And in fact, the regulations that are left sort of don't make any sense given the, the things we've relaxed. So if you can give $10 million to a secret group that we don't know how you're spending the money, why do we care that you can only give $3,000 directly to a candidate? Maybe at some point it'd be better just to let, take the limits off and let them give it to candidates and you know, let the candidates make the speech. Gentlemen, Melanie, thanks for joining us. This was great. And I'll be back with a final thought. In the theatrics of the US elections, catchy names like soundbites have a role to play. Paradoxically, the more they serve a special interest, the more patriotic they sound. Americans for prosperity, my America, your America, Americans for America, patriotic Americans for a more patriotic and American America. And we love the USA. And there are the bizarre and sarcastic super PAC names like Americans for a better tomorrow tomorrow, or Americans for a better tomorrow yesterday, and dogs against Romney. And my favorite names, bears for a bearable tomorrow, or citizens against super PACs, super PAC. Alas, this last one collected only $35. Well, the way I see it, the dominant super PACs merit only one suitable name. A few bitter old rich white men for more white men and money. And that's the way it goes. Write to me with your comments and suggestions. Until next time.